Thank you very much, John, and it really is my pleasure and privilege to be um, here with you all this evening. And um, you may know that tomorrow, um, the 1st of March, St. David's Day, uh, is also the first day of Women's History Month. So in anticipation of Women's History Month, that's why I've chosen to, to give this um, talk this evening, In and Out of the Imagination. Um, this paper actually is very much a work in progress, and I know that can send um, trepidation through an audience, but I have thought things through. But it is part of a larger project I'm trying to do at the moment, which actually is trying to bring together uh, Persian studies together with biblical studies. Um, some of the really good work that's being done in biblical studies at the moment is on the iconography of the biblical world. So biblical historians, biblical scholars are looking especially at the Hebrew Bible and trying to think about the visual world that underpins um, the Hebrew Bible. Um, this is a, an area which has its expertise mainly from um, uh, um, a school of thought from Sweden uh, as well as from Switzerland. And really great work has been done on the Book of Psalms, for instance, looking at the, the text of the Book of Psalms and then thinking of how visual imagery of the ancient world um, can augment our understanding. And I thought, actually, we have a very good opportunity um, within a Persian context to do that too. And I'm trying to work at the moment on a, on a book on the, the Hebrew Bible's Book of Esther, which, of course, is set in the Achaemenid court at Susa, um, probably dates um, authentically to around about five to 400 BC. It's probably an Achaemenid period text, um, most of it at least. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do there is to bring the visual world of uh, the Book of Esther to life. And of course, the Book of Esther um, is set at the Persian court, absolutely there, and it's full of women. Uh, it's one of the most women-heavy books of the Hebrew Bible, a fa fabulous book, actually, uh, a tale about women, concubines, queenship, eunuchs as well, so even a third sex. So in putting all of that work together, I've been thinking quite a lot about the use of images, the, the imagery, and how we think about the women of Achaemenid Iran. And the difficulty we have in trying to locate them because of the limitations, the serious limitations we have on the source materials. And the way in which those source materials that have survived have been used and very often abused by usually well-intentioned individuals who are actually misunderstanding, perhaps, though, the cogency, the underlying message of the artistic image of women created in the Achaemenid period, that is to say, between 559 to 330 BCE. So that's what I want to try to address here, is both the reality of the image, or what we have of the image of Persian women, and then I want to think as well about the context in which Persian women are being utilized in contemporary art and thought. So with that in mind, I am going to start with a contemporary image. And I'm sure it's one that many of you will recognize. Um, maybe you have it at home. Uh, maybe you have it on a t-shirt or on a purse uh, because it's an extremely well-known uh, contemporary image which is circulating readily in Iran and outside of Iran within its diaspora as well. It's a very, very popular print. These are available all over Iran at tourist sites, at bazaars, at bookshops where you can buy them for very, very little money. Properly produced in high gloss um, quality prints, posters essentially. The image purportedly shows Cyrus the Great and his wife, um, who is called by Herodotus, a Greek source. We have nothing on uh, Cyrus's wives from the indigenous sources, Mandane. And it's set within the ruins of some kind of Achaemenid palace. You can see perhaps the Apadana columns of Persepolis in the background, as well as the doorways of the Tachara of Darius the Great. Now this work comes from the brush of a very popular Persian artist who uh, now lives in Los Angeles, although he was born in Gorgan, uh, Hojat Shakiba. And his books sell exceptionally well, both within and without of Iran, especially amongst the Iranian diaspora. As a graduate of fine arts at Tehran University, um, he studied European painting, but has turned his attention really to the way in which he can utilize the arts of ancient Iran in a kind of modern setting. 
and his publications to date, which are usually very large and very glossy and extremely heavy when you're trying to drag them back from Tehran Airport, include things such as Kayam, the Divan of Hafez, um, a remarkable book called Iran Docht, which is his tribute really to Persian women, the role of photos in Iranian art, which is his version of uh, Qajar art, and more recently he's turned his attention to Kurosh, so a huge uh, volume on Cyrus the Great, and very recently he has done a version, a truncated version of course, of Shahnameh too. So he sells well, and he sells well in a myriad of different motifs too. So you can find this popular work, among many others of his, as I say, in posters, in well-framed pieces, um, tote bags, uh, CD-ROMs, and T-shirts. It's a very readily available image. Now, I need to problematize this image straight away because it's Shakiba's vision then of Cyrus the Great and his wife. Although he himself, he's never admitted this, I don't think in any writing at least, takes his inspiration from a German print that was created in 1861 by Braun and Schneider's historic costumes, an anthology of ancient and modern costumes by a German publisher. And you can see that the, uh, the Cyrus image is, um, oh, you, this doesn't work, this one at the uh, top right. Uh, and you can see therefore that he's essentially copied this um, completely um, freely. Uh, after all, it is a copyright free image from 1861 and morphed it into something which is um, appealing to the Iranian populace today. So it's kind of strange straight away that we actually have a Western creation, a Western fantasy of, uh, of a Mead. Actually, this, this, this um, plate is called a Mead, a Median king and his queen. It's not named Osiris, and it's morphed by placing this into a setting of the ruins of Persepolis. Now, so influential is this popular print in Iran today that I've been really quite amazed over my last few visits to Iran to see how it is being utilized in very clearly public spaces. This, for instance, is the lobby of the Homa Hotel in Shiraz, where now a huge sculpture um, has been placed um, near the piano bar, uh, which shows, again, you can see there, um, a version of uh, Shokiba's um, popular print. This time, the Persepolis ma um, background has disappeared, and we have, of course, the tomb of Cyrus um, uh, identified there. And you also see that Cyrus holds in his hand this bizarre owl kind of bird. This is the Homa bird, I suppose, Iran Air's um, uh, logo. And while behind, uh, be below them, you can see these young maidens are bringing them the Nowruz gifts. So here, of course, Cyrus has been acclimatized now into a new uh, context, which includes Nowruz. So you can see that um, Shakiba is the source, the clear inspiration uh, for, for this sculpture. And I'm finding more and more of these in the Espinas Hotel in uh, Tehran, for instance. There's also um, this kind of tribute to Shakiba going on too. And in his most recent work on Kurosh, uh, again, he revisits this very popular theme um, here with Kurosh and his wife, Mandane. And you can see also, I'll just put this one up here closer to me, the way in which one of the, one of the motifs that Shakiba likes to, uh, to play with is the use of the pre-Islamic relief, which he kind of brings to life, if you like. So this image here, for instance, is the very famous uh, genie um, guardian, uh, which we see at the gateway into Parsagad. It's often been called the, a portrait of Cyrus the Great. It's, it really has nothing to do with that. But here we can see he's using that motif and kind of then um, creating a, a veristic or a more lifelike portrait head of the Cyrus figure within it. So we're playing with um, the imagery of the pre-Islamic past is going on in Shakiba's oeuvre. I want to concentrate on one or two more of his images now because um, as I come on to the ancient materials, then really this was going to be used as kind of a, a critique in some kind of way of Shakiba's art. And I should say here, I'm not really judging it on its stylistic um, qualities. It's up to you if you like it. Personally, I find it a little kitsch, 
but it is selling in its thousands and people are responding to this kind of art. And I'll be very interested to know your opinions of some of this art later on when it comes to the, the question and answer time too. So take, for instance, this uh, image here. Um, it is known, uh, this comes from Iran Docht, his publication Iran Docht, and it is simply called Atusa, or Atossa, and this, of course, is the name that we have of the wife of Darius the Great, or the mother of Xerxes. We have no portrait of this woman whatsoever from antiquity, but this is Shakiba's envisaging of this very powerful woman. And if you look at the motif itself, we have this, this portrait head, um, and then you can see actually what we have is a, a melange, a kind of mashup, if you like, of genuine, bona fide, Achaemenid style images. So you can see essentially the background is made up from um, glazed tiles, which are found at Persepolis as well as at Susa. Um, the Sphinx character, reversed in Shakiba's image, found at Persepolis. And if you look across the, the chest of Atusa, you can see actually she is kind of carved with cuneiform as well. So old Persian inscription is going on there too. So one of Shakiba's aims is to bring this kind of diversity of antiquity together into his picture of womanhood, I suppose. So woman becomes to represent for him the idea of ancient Iran. And that brings us to the head of Atusa herself. So this portrait that he's brought to life in a very uh, virilistic 20th century uh, realist kind of manner is based, of course, on this tiny, tiny little head uh, made out of um, uh, um, turquoise, Iranian turquoise, which was found at Persepolis, dating to around about 500, 540 BCE, um, and uh, is now in the National Museum in Tehran. What he's doing there, of course, is making the claim that this is not only uh, a female head, but it's also the head of um, Atusa. It's the head of Atossa as well. It's demanding, a, giving a portrait tradition um, to this unidentified little head. And in fact, he likes this head so much that in several other pieces of his work, again, he engages with this small uh, piece of turquoise. I just want to show you what else he does with the female image before um, I press on to look at some of the ancient artifacts themselves. But here, for instance, uh, again, we have um, this time a female head in profile set against one of the pillars from Persepolis. Um, you can see that at her cheek, there is this flower, which is a standard motif that we see in Persepolitan uh, art uh, of this period, as well as um, the dog, one of two dogs, uh, guardian figures, which were discovered at the door jams to the Apadana uh, at Persepolis by Hertzfeld in the 1930s. Uh, and incidentally, these dogs look very lionine. Um, they, 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 that's because they were badly restored in the 1930s. They are supposed to be bull mastiffs, so they're supposed to have pointy snouts. But here we are again, this whole mashup of a seem to be quite a bizarre assemblage of different Achaemenid icons, not really telling a story uh, so much as just a, a strange assemblage of different motifs from the Achaemenid period with the head of a strong-looking woman um, to um, support it all. Sometimes Shakiba, as it were, draws back his focus and he gives us much wider uh, perspective, but again, a kind of playfulness on the female image. So here in this, um, this, this uh, strange kind of peasant costume that she wears, you can see that the young woman's head, which is veiled and crowned with a chaplet of roses, comes across her shoulder and then morphs into the wing of the Lamassu, or the winged bull, which of course is one of the great guardian figures uh, at the gateway of all nations built by Xerxes. So again, there's this kind of um, desire to make the sculptures, to make the Achaemenid past a kind of female uh, um, um, presence by really morphing the ancient and the contemporary together. And you see that too. Uh, just here, where we have, again, a very strange assemblage. This time, uh, a young woman lying on the ground in a garden. She wears the uh, Fatavish uh, um, sign around her neck. You can see the wings of the winged deity, Ahura Mazda, are behind her. There's a very odd presence of one of the, what looks like actually a, um, probably a Scythian, um, uh, bringing a, uh, 
uh, a dagger within uh, its gilded um, scabbard as well. So this is typical of his work. And really, if you were to, to just flick through quite casually any of his later works, Iran Dacht, Kurosh, Shahnameh, this is the kind of mashup that you're getting constantly um, in his work. Or sometimes he just distances the actual objects themselves, the Achaemenid objects which we see in the museums, and he uses the, the landscape of ruins as the place for um, the female locale. And if you look at this, it's, it's a very strange image for me. You know, love it or hate it, it's up to you, as I say. But first of all, we have Persepolis in its ruined state, of course, as it is today. And yet it takes on this, this theme of the marsh. It becomes a, a watery area where lilies and flowers bloom in abundance. Clearly, it's a fertile area, but has nothing to do, of course, with the real located space. And then drifting through these with their kind of um, garments blowing in the wind are these kind of hoary, these kind of female fantasy figures, these, these fairy figures, almost as kind of memories, if you like, of a haunted past of Persepolis drifting through. It's not great art, but it is clearly speaking to people because people are buying these things in their droves. But what does it do to our perception of the Achaemenid past proper? Because I'm sure, as you'll all be aware, that when you go to Persepolis, when you're at Takht e Jamshid, you can look in vain for any figure of a female whatsoever. There are simply no women represented in the official wall art of uh, Achaemenid Iran. They simply are not there. It is not part of the agenda of the Achaemenids to give us any form of a female presence. So what we have really on the walls of Persepolis, in every corner of Persepolis, is a kind of hyper-masculinity. This is the art of empire building, after all. And while the art might eschew the form that, say, the Assyrians took, and maybe many of you went to the magnificent Ashurbanipal exhibition at the British Museum recently, and there you see the cruelty, the horror of the way in which the, the Persians, uh, the, sorry, the Assyrians um, suggest their empire building through, through real you know, brutality. Here at Persepolis, of course, we have this stately presence, an endless Pax Persica. The world is at peace, of course, but it is nonetheless a male peace. And you really have to look hard to find anything that's female. In fact, there is one, one thing that is female on the walls of Persepolis, and it's this lioness. And she is the gift of the Elamites, who are bringing her to the great king, and she's only there because the two cubs they are holding have not yet been weaned. And you can see, actually, her teats are still hanging low. So she, she is still feeding them. So she's only there because it's pragmatic to have her there. Otherwise, this is the only female of any species to be found at Persepolis. So that causes us a great problem. Where do we locate, then, the women of Achaemenid Iran. Where are they? They must have been there. Where are they? Our Greek sources speak a lot about Achaemenid women, but our Greek sources, Herodotus, Ctesias, Xenophon, and Plutarch, writing usually after the fall of the Achaemenid Empire, very often tell stories of salaciousness, of powerful, ruthless women, of course, which are not rooted in any reality, but they are literally topoi. Herodotus does make an interesting statement, though. He says, the Arabians and the Ethiopians who dwell above Egypt had as a commander Arsames, the son of Darius, and Artaistani, daughter of Cyrus, whom Darius loved best of his wives. He had an image made of her of hammered gold. Now, while I wouldn't want to swear on my life to anything that Herodotus says, here this idea that maybe then Images of women, certainly of high-ranking court ladies, are made in precious materials is quite compelling, I think. So maybe what we need to do is start to look for women in different kinds of media. Absence of evidence, of course, doesn't mean absence of their 
physical and uh, influential presence, and that's something to bear in mind. As Maria Brosius has hinted at in her 1996 book, Women in Ancient Persia, and then more recently in an article called No Reason to Hide, Women in the Neo-Elamite and Persian Periods. But really, <clears throat> our investigation into the female image in Achaemenid Iran is only just beginning. And that's why I'm glad to have this opportunity to try this paper with you, uh, but also to begin the work I'm doing on the Book of Esther. So really, two things, two questions I want to ask for this paper. The first is, what does the material culture suggest about Persian women? What can we learn about them from the actual artifacts that I'm going to show you? And secondly, what then do we do with the legacy of these artifacts when they are used in the way that, say, Shakiba is using them? Because I never think, as an ancient historian, I never think that the past, that ancient history is dead and done for. It is a vital, vital subject. It keeps on living. And I think the work of Shakiba is really showing that. And again, love him or loathe him, he nevertheless has a voice, and it's an important one that we have to take into account. So these are the questions that I want to ask today. I can't guarantee any, uh, any answers to them, but I think the questions are wor worth asking. So what I want to do uh, in this section is to introduce you to the evidence of the material culture of Iran for Persian women. And I've opted to look at central Iran because I could find some evidence from um, Turkey, from Anatolia as well. But I want to look at what uh, John Boardman once identified as a court style. So that is to say a kind of centralized um, Persian focus on the women of Iran. So I'm drawing really evidence from this kind of central heart of the Persian Empire, stretching down to southwest Iran and to Mesopotamia and to the Levantine coast. That's where we find a kind of um, a, an articulation of the female image in a recognizable form which bears resemblance one one piece of material culture to another, so a court style in essence. So if we follow Herodotus with this idea that maybe there were images of women, but they're certainly not large scale pieces, like the kinds of things we see in the wall reliefs of Persepolis, then where do we find them? Well, we find them in one of the most important aspects of all ancient Near Eastern iconography, and that is the cylinder seal. Everybody worth their salt in the ancient Near East had their own seal. In a pre-literate society, it was the equivalent of having your own signature. And of course, in the ancient world, in the ancient Mesopotamia, through writing on clay tablets, individuals could take their seal and press it into the damp clay, leaving their mark there. Cylinder seals um, are found out throughout the whole of the Persian Empire. And great work by Mark Garrison and Margaret Root have analyzed the kinds of seals discovered specifically at Persepolis. We can put names to individual seals. We know exactly where people have been. Now, we don't always get that luxury, but what we do get is every now and then a fascinating glimpse at bona fide, genuine Achaemenid women on these very important transmitters of image. Because if you think about it, the seal, which is usually made of some kind of semi-precious stone, in this case, chalcedony, stays with the wearer. Usually, it's on a necklace. But the image, which is implanted into the wet clay, can travel far and wide. It's like having coinage today. So the image goes far and wide. So this is a really fascinating image. It was probably found at Susa. We can't be absolutely sure of the provenance, and it dates to the middle to the end of the fifth century. This is a, a larger image of it, but what I've done here for you is to give you a line drawing so you can see a little more clearly. Now I'm gonna to try to interpret what at least my reading of this is. Three women are represented on the left, a woman seats, seated on a high-backed throne, her feet off the ground on a footstool. She wears a long robe, which is ample in its folds, with wide sleeves. She has a crown, which you can see there are crenellations there, and she wears a very long veil, which she sits on, and you can see that there are motifs on this veil as well. In front of her, a younger 
girl, quite clearly a younger um, in terms of size, but she looks younger, wears the same kind of robe, although it's shorter. Her hairstyle is interesting. That's either a plait or um, a, 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 a piece of a string or something, and she holds a, a dove or a pigeon in her hand. In the middle of them, that great big blobby thing is actually an incense burner, and then behind is another woman wearing a crenellated crown with bobbed hair, a short veil to falls down to her back, and the same kind of garment as the seated woman, this large, voluminous, draped garment as well. And she holds in her hand something indistinguishable here, but it's probably um, a, a kind of a, a, a ritual bucket, actually. So that puts us to the question, what's going on here? Some people have said, well, this is a, a religious scene. Everybody seems to want to find religious scenes wherever they go, and that this is the seated goddess Anahita and two worshippers. I'm not so sure of that. I think, actually, this is a scene showing three different generations of royal women. The status is quite clear in the seating position of the woman on the far left, um, also her clothes. So I think this is the older woman. We have maybe uh, a queen mother in that case. Maybe here we have a queen, and here we have a daughter, or possibly even a concubine. What really comes to the fore when we look at the composition of this kind of scene, including the throne, the footstool, and the incense burner, is a very, very well-known motif in Persian art, and that is the royal audience motif. So whether done in large-scale sculpture, two of them found at Persepolis, or again on cylinder seals, which are widely disseminated, you can see there that this idea of um, procession, uh, some kind of order, is being represented on this female seal as well. We do have other seals which possibly show females. I don't want to be absolutely um, definite on this because it's a very strange um, headdress. But the same high-backed throne, footstool, and flower-holding motif is going on there, too. This was found at Persepolis. There are um, very interesting motifs that are um, um, shared between all of them. One of them is this idea of holding the flower. Um, it used to be thought that when we saw kings holding this flower, that it was a symbol of the Egyptian lotus, but that makes very little sense to me, especially from the early Achaemenid period when really Egypt wasn't conquered and the lotus isn't indigenous to Iran. It's far more likely to be the pomegranate flower, I think, which is more of a, an idea of, first of all, the indigenous land of Iran, but also in a female context has a long history of fertility as well. And I think this is why it's so prominent, perhaps, in these two images of the females. Now, what we don't know, so sadly, is who these women are, let alone who this seal belonged to. But that women held seals is absolutely certain. Um, that's because we know quite a lot from the Persepolis fortification texts about essentially the structure of the imperial harem. And by harem, I'm not thinking of some kind of um, European fantasy of scatter cushions, belly dancers, and Persian kittens. I'm thinking here of the kind of dynastic inner circle of the royal court. Women who had access to the king, to their sons, had, of course, access to power. And we must think of the Achaemenid Empire like some kind of um, uh, family business, essentially. So the women of the inner court, the women of the inner family, had real say, a particular political clout within that family. Of course, within this, the structure um, really operates around the king's mother. And while a king could have many wives, he could only ever have one blood mother. And so while she was alive, she kind of reigned supreme in the female hierarchy. There seemed to be variation. There doesn't seem to be an official um, role for one queen, but certainly um, women of uh, particular authority or particular charms um, uh, can rise to positions of power. And beneath them, we have a whole series of royal wives, royal daughters, and royal sisters. Now, in the texts, in the Elamite texts that we have, these women are always unified by the word dukshishbi, princesses. 
and that's the Elamite title, it seems, that unites all of these women together. Dukshish is literally daughter in Elamite, Dukshishbi as the, the women of the inner court, the, 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 the royal family's princesses, if you like. Beyond that, of course, we then have women who are brought in from different parts of the empire as trade, as war booty, these are concubines, as well as a myriad of administrators and palace servants who we never hear of. Now, <clears throat> we know of the importance of some of these women whom we can actually name because of the fortification text from Persepolis. So, for instance, one woman dominates the texts, and her name is Irdabama. It's an Elamite name, incidentally, a very interesting Elamite name. And she clearly had vast estates. She has spoken about more than any other woman. And she has more grain, more slaves, more workers than anybody else. For a long time, we didn't know who she was, but my colleague, Wouter Henkelmann, I think has very rightly suggested that she's probably the mother of Darius the Great, uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense, a lot of sense. And we see her in these kind of ration lists, you see, having accounts done for her. Now, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, she must have, we know that she had a seal, and she would have been putting her seal on documents like this. We also know that she had servants who also worked for her and put their seals too. So we can trace these women through the literary texts. And we know that her lands occupied not only central Iran, but also off into Iraq. She had large estates. And also from the fortification texts, we know that she was able to travel independently of the king or of any man. So women had a certain freedoms. Now, when I talk about freedoms, I don't want us to think in modern day parlance when we think about today's popular culture. We equate um, publicity with, um, with, with, with um, clearly being seen, our image is known. I think in the ancient Near East, and actually in Iran up until the Qajar period, there was no honor in a woman being publicly seen. The idea of a woman's honor and high status actually is in her invisibility. And this is why I think we don't have large-scale images of women on palace reliefs. If they are going to be seen, they're only going to be seen on small circulations of inner circle um, uh, kinds of arts. But they travel widely, they, ha they have enormous amount of wealth too. And that goes too for the king's wives. One wife in particular keeps coming up in the texts. Um, this is Darius the Great's wife, and her name is Ishtaduna. This Ishtaduna is the same woman, a Tystony, that Herodotus talks about with the little gold statuette. She is there constantly. Interestingly, Atossa, Darius's wife uh, who gives birth to Xerxes, only appears in the fortification text four times. She's very little known, actually, from the indigenous sources. Herodotus talks about her all the time, but the indigenous sources give us a very different picture. We also have texts talking about royal daughters as well. So we know that these women are present. We know that economically they have clout and that they are traveling around the empire. They have their own estates, they have their own servants. And their image is being propounded, propelled to um, different parts of the empire, probably within these inner circles, in things like seal images, but interestingly also in textiles as well. And of course, this is the kind of thing that doesn't tend to survive. We do have, we are very, very lucky from about 400 BC to have textiles which are preserved in the ice of uh, the Crimea at Pazidic. Uh, maybe you saw the, Siberi uh, the, uh, the Scythian exhibition at the BM. Some of these textiles were on display there. And if you look, we have on these two textile motifs here, um, these women, one of whom has, is taller, wearing the crenulated crown and the veil, the other shorter with the bobbed hair, and you can see them again at an altar or, or, or a, um, a brazier here. Um, these are clearly being entered into the textile tradition. These motifs are traveling, and of course, as we know from later periods of Iranian history, textiles are a very, very good way of getting these images um, out into uh, different spheres. Beyond that, the images we have of uh, Achaemenid women are all miniature in form. The Oxus treasure, for instance, has some gold hammered um, pieces, such as number seven at the center. 
Otherwise, they are small coal containers, um, not of particular brilliance, but nevertheless giving us some idea of the female image. And notice that all of them hold that pomegranate flower. More interestingly, coming from Amman, is this caryatid brazier. So we've seen the brazier at the center of the um, scene uh, there. Well, this is one in, in three dimensions. And it's interesting that it, it, it is really essentially the idea of woman as an object herself. And this is something which I'd like to explore a lot more um, in the Iranian context. It's very well explored in, say, an ancient Greek context, the idea of the caryatid, the woman as mirror or the woman as pillar but I'd like to go further uh, and look at this in Iran too. You can see that she wears the bobbed hair um, and the typical uh, large, long, and pleated garment. And then from the Al Sabe collection is this remarkable little cosmetic flask, absolutely glorious, exquisite in detail. And this really does seem to suggest that Herodotus is on to something with this idea of high status objects conveying the image of women, because this is really of the highest possible quality. Probably a perfume container, possibly for Col. Uh, you can see the stopper there um, at the top. She again wears this long dress, holds the pomegranate flower, and wears the crenulated crown. And there's an accompaniment as well. There's a companion piece to this too, which actually has a chain still attached to it, suggesting that perhaps it was part of a pendant uh, at one point too. But really a very, very exquisite piece. Of less, um, of, of less beauty, I suppose, but still important, is a, a bronze tube in the British Museum and also uh, in the Ashmolean. Again, though, showing in less detail the same kinds of garments and the same kinds of hairstyle. We do have continuity in all of these pieces, as well as in ivory, this beautiful cosmetic jar from Phoenicia. And in fact, the Phoenician coast, modern-day Lebanon, has given us a lot of examples, uh, well, <laughs> a lot, has given us three examples of, that's a lot, of Achaemenid women um, in conspicuous Persian style costume. So this extent of the court style is clearly there in, in uh, Phoenicia as well. And perhaps the best of these are these absolutely glorious um, Phoenician ivory figurines which are now in the Louvre and I'll come back to those. Within stone sculpture we only have one piece of relief sculpture surviving, and that's a very, very small piece indeed, no more than seven centimeters high, now in uh, the Brooklyn Museum in New York, um, found at Sousa and dating to the mid part of the fifth century. This shows a woman, again, with a distinctive bobbed hairstyle, the draped gown, and her hands with one hand over the other wrist. And this is a, a motif which we can find right the way back in, Sassain, uh, in um, Elamite art, and it's always a gesture of prayer. Uh, in Elamite art. So here we have uh, a, a prayer figurine. And then finally, the piece de resistance is this head that we have in Tehran. And obviously, originally, its eyes were inlaid with probably semi-precious stones or crystal, perhaps. It probably, it's a tiny head, only this high, and it probably sat originally on a wooden body, I would think, uh, a kind of zoanon, and that has disappeared. Uh, only the, the turquoise head remains. And of course, it's this that brings us back to Shakiba. Now, the difficulty with all of this is, first of all, is that we've, we've seen the whole corpus, as far as I know, of Achaemenid art on women. I don't know of any other pieces. So really, we can count them on three pairs of hands, what we have. Not much to go on at all for that artistic image. But what we do with it is interesting, I think. So Shakiba has utilized this image to create not only the figure of a woman, but also of a specific woman, a Tusa, a Tossa. But I think, actually, we can't be certain about that. There's a real gender ambiguity going on with this head and with several of the uh, images I've shown you. But this head in particular. One of the real frustrations we have with the Achaemenid period is the lack of burial sites, the lack of uh, forensic evidence, um, bones essentially. In Susa in the 1930s, very famously one Achaemenid 
um, burial was discovered. It's a very, very rare thing. This is a watercolor that was made of it in the 1930s. And you can see that the skeleton uh, is surrounded by grave goods, including a lot of very, very fine jewelry, most of which is now in the Louvre. We are still not certain of the sex of this individual. And the fact that the accoutrement, the jewelry itself, gives us absolutely no indication because it's quite clear that men and women wore the same style of jewelry. I see no difference, actually, in anything that's being worn. It's kind of intersex, if anything. Moreover, this head, which Shakiba and many others have identified as female, bears striking resemblance to another group of images that we do see on large-scale sculpture, beardless youths. Now, these are not going to be women, these are actually either young princes or more likely to be eunuchs, castrated uh, servants of the great kings. And they are quite remarkable in terms of um, Achaemenid portraiture, if you want to use that word, because, of course, they eschew the usual masculine um, icon of the beard. And, of course, kings like Darius on the far left there have the biggest beards as the alpha male. So having these individuals devoid of beards must alert us to the fact that something is going on with some kind of gender ambiguity. And I think we need to turn our attention more and more in Persian studies to the idea of a kind of third sex. Um, we're, we're kind of um, constrained, in a way, by our lack of uh, literature on this from a Persian perspective. Uh, in Akkadian, in Mesopotamian cultures, we know that actually it, it, it wasn't enough just to talk about males and females, but there was a whole strand of individuals in between that who played um, with kind of gender ambiguities. And we, we haven't done as much work on Persia as I'd like to. So what do we have here? Do we have a male or a female? Very hard to tell, but I do think we have a clue and that's in the headdress itself. Now, you can see that Persian eunuchs seem to wear a crown too, but it's flat. It's the crenellations, actually, that give me um, some hope that we do have a woman here, and that is because within a context of Iran, both past and, and in the future, we have um, crenellated females. You see the head down here on the left. This is an Elamite queen, actually carved at Naqshir Rustam, um, below here, an Assyrian queen, Ashashurat, uh, wearing these crenellations. They're supposed to be the mural crown of a wall. And here, from the Parthian period, uh, we have also um, a crenellated crown too. So on balance, I think it's probably right that the Achaemenid head is a female. Uh, certainly when we look at the other forms of crenellation or pointed crowns, that we have elsewhere. I couldn't say that she's particularly royal or, or unique, and I certainly wouldn't want to call her uh, a, a tosser, but I think um, Shakiba is probably right in, in the idea that she's female. But there's more problems here with ambiguity, and that is to do with dress itself. The garments that are being worn by each of these women in all of the examples I've shown you are what I've identified in some of my work previously. I've called it the court robe. It's different to the riding habit that Iranians wear when on horseback, the so-called median garment. The court garment was a large um, rectangle of linen or wool, possibly even silk, which required no cutting, uh, was simply belted at the waist, and then arranged into neat folds. Now, these are very stylistically represented in art, um, such as the silver image from the Oxus treasure, or the image of Darius the Great from Susa, or this little ivory image from, uh, from Phoenicia. Very uh, regularly um, imposed pleats has made interpretation of this um, uh, for some people really problematic, and some people have wanted to see pleats being sewn in or sleeves being sewn in. It's not that. Believe me, it's simply a poncho which is belted, and therefore was open to much movement. But what's interesting is, I see no difference whatsoever in the garments worn by women as the garments worn by men. If that's the case, this is really quite unique for the ancient world, where gender is sharply differentiated through dress, through, through the actual construction and the draping of clothes. Um, this is really quite remarkable. Now, of course, what we don't have are any of the details of color or decoration. Were there gender differences in what kind of colors that were worn in Iran? We simply can't say. And I wouldn't be, feel safe going down that um, area anyway. 
what we have here is essentially the same garment, the kind of unisex garment that is worn by both men and by women, even to the point of decoration is the same too. So one of the things that we see very often are these um, brackets, little gold um, motifs which were sewn onto the, onto the garment. And of course, very often the, the textiles have decayed over the centuries, but the gold decoration has stayed. So you see here uh, a Persian king from Persepolis with all of that over him. But look, if you look on the sleeves, so-called sleeves of this Phoenician woman, you can also see that she's wearing the same kind of um, styles too. So intrinsically, the garment types themselves are no different. And that is really quite revolutionary, very, very different in terms of anything going on in the rest of the Near East or indeed of the Mediterranean of this period. The only differentiation in terms of showing the specific sex of individuals really is in the uh, augmentation of the breasts, which occur on many of these images, sometimes quite kind of unnaturally so. Um, the artist goes out of his way to show the female body beneath the unisex garment, in fact. And sometimes this is done because the local traditions demand it. So these beautiful Phoenician ivories that we've looked at actually bear a great resemblance, at least in um, the, the gesture, to these uh, Philistine and uh, Levantine uh, fertility goddesses who, who lift up their breasts as well. So I think we have here a, a kind of amalgamation of Persian court styles and traditional Canaanite or Levantine styles as well. And even if we go back to our seals, we can see there as well the breasts are being shown very clearly beneath these otherwise unisex garments. I just wanted one tiny disc, uh, excursus really. If I was to take you to another part of the Persian Empire, uh, and that is to say Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, the seal images that we have of women there show a distinctly different physique. Uh, and what happens there is all the emphasis goes on the buttocks, in fact. This is what I was talking about in that article, The Big and Beautiful Women of Asia. Uh, and there was a, there's a very distinct um, look, kind of almost like a, a, a bustle, a shelf, that goes on there. So images, uh, what I'm trying to say there is images of, of beauty, conceptions of beauty, uh, are not regular across the Persian Empire. Different parts of the empire seem to fetishize um, different parts of the female body as well. Now, all of this brings us back then, finally, to Shakiba. I've put all of the evidence in front of you. What does Shakiba do with it, and what is it doing to us as viewers of the Achaemenid Empire who are maybe only accessing the ancient world through the likes of Shakiba? I do find difficulties with the way in which he pronounces on the sex of some of these images, which are actually uh, far more fluid. So you can see here the Persian eunuch images. He has definitely turned into a female, completely feminized and turned them into a female. He says in his introduction to Iran Docht, Shakiba's angst is history. Yeah, it's mine too. A proud history that has shaped the identification of Iranian artists. When Shakiba paints a coronated woman, it is as if he is sweeping back the black curtain, obviously the chador of censorship, demanding that Iranian women attain their rightful and mythological position. I don't doubt that he is trying to empower Achaemenid women, or maybe the women of Iran who are looking at these images, but is it really justified? His use of the chador, of this, of this black veil that is drawing back, I find really um, quite, quite strange, given the fact that he routinely veils his women. Um, and while it might be a gauzy yashmak, nevertheless, it is still distancing them behind the veil. Interestingly, the idea of the veil and Persepolis is something which is also located very much in the Western mind when it comes to the image of Iran. So you only have to Google Persepolis tourism, and you will find images like this constantly. So these are from National Geographic. And it is, again, this idea that um, Persepolis is located through the body of the woman. In this case, of course, it is the chadored woman of the Iranian Revolution, not the image of the um, Achaemenid, softer, chocolate box version that um, Shakiba likes to draw on. Here you can see, again, how he's utilizing Achaemenid animal imagery. And animal imagery in Achaemenid art is very, very strong, very powerful, and usually uber-masculine. Like the bull, for instance, um, a great symbol of fertility, is here completely feminized with the merging, really, of this woman's hair 
often a motif in his work as well, um, with the mane of the bull. Persepolis for Shakiba is always a ruin. He never shows Persepolis as it would have been. He doesn't take his imagination there. He always allows Persepolis to remain a ruin. And the way that he put places women against them, drifting through them, become a kind of nostalgia for a past, for a past that doesn't necessarily want, it seems, to be rebuilt at all. And the other motif he undertakes is the idea of the faded fresco, too. It's as though history is wiping out, the color is leaving uh, Iran, ancient Persia, and what we're left with is, are just sun-bleached or unfinished images. More distressingly for me, however, is a kind of what I think of as a sort of self-orientalization that's going on in these images. When we take uh, an image like this of his, this is from uh, Iran Docht, where we see this um, young woman, lovely woman with bunches of flowers, standing in front of uh, Shapur, who of course, in his context at Naqsh Rostam, is showing himself as the ultimate successful Shah in that two, not one, but two Roman emperors are at their knees in front of him. What's happening in Shakiba's art is a, an effeminization, a kind of self-orientalization of this. It's not allowing ancient Iran to be um, an empire on its own terms. It's, it's, a, it's a softening, a bleaching, if you like, of Iran's power. And this really goes on to, in the final images I will show here, of this integration of the male and the female head. The male head from the past, the relief, and then juxtaposed with the female head. And of course, you can see here that both of these images, again, draw on the little um, head from Persepolis. And I think most worrying of all, if Shakiba is trying to get an image over of a powerful or, or, a, or, a, or a society of women to be taken seriously, um, is this image where um, a, an unknown woman lays her head on the shoulder of Cyrus the Great. Now, I'm really interested to know what you, you, you think, how you react to these images. I see them in one particular way. But what I fail to see in Shakiba's imagery is anything of the power, actually, of this tiny little seal. The seal might be, you know, tiny size and located only to, to one particular woman, but actually, if we look at the kind of iconography here, it really says something about the power of women um, in ancient Iranian court society. I want to finish with a few more images, uh, again, of women at Persepolis, but I think it's so much more interesting to allow women to show themselves at Persepolis, how they want to be seen at Persepolis, what their claiming of the past is, and whether that's in holiday snaps, over periods of different lifestyle. I find these far more appealing and far more uh, meaningful, playing with the past, standing up for the past, utilizing the past, taking selfies with the past. I think there is a role, there's a definite role um, for the use of the past uh, at Persepolis and other sites uh, around Iran in our projection of how antiquity um, functioned, but maybe not the chocolate box vision, because ultimately what I think Shakiba does is to take away the cogency of the reality of women's lives in Iran in the past and in the present. Thanks very much indeed.